instructors, he asked me to say a word. His favorite color is blue, and he's Aquarius. So just so you know, really critical things. Patrick is a, an amazing speaker. He's a professor. He's a consultant. He works with many school districts, with states, with uh, communities to help uh, get excellent practices, including and primarily inclusion, but for everybody. He has a number of books. We have several books for sale. And also, during the silent auction, Patrick and Charlene Tanner will be signing some books. So I want you to have the real deal, and I'd like you to help me introduce Patrick Schwartz for our afternoon keynote. Everybody, it's wonderful to be back here at Peak, and it's just a very welcoming thing. Um, one of the things Barb didn't mention about me is that I'm an adult with ADHD, so you're going to see a lot of things coming up uh, during this little talk. And so I want to thank you, first of all, for the balloons, the multiple screens, um, and also my movement ramp here. Um, it's like a runway, so I'm very happy about that. Um, because Anton, who's doing the filming, good luck. And <laughs> so, Let's talk a little bit because I'm going to go to my slides. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. And here we go. Uh, so I have an update to start with today. Uh, we are going to be talking about special education makeover and reimagining special education. That's my new work that I'm working on. And I need to give an update because my first two books have the word possibility in them. The first book was From Disability to Possibility. The fifth book was From Possibility to Success, and they work hand in hand. And I have an update. So one of the things, I apologize, I'm walking in front of you. And the update is, what inspired me to create possibility studies is a three-year-old niece at the time that when she saw for the first time um, somebody come quite near her that was using a wheelchair to get around, she started doing a clinging thing to my wife. And she was scared at the time, and I'm thinking, wow, this is something. I've devoted my professional career to advancing the status of people who have possibilities of diversity things such as that, and here I have a relative who is clinging to my leg. But then I said to myself, I need to educate her. And so I went to my uncle at the Schwarz, his store at the time, and he's not my uncle, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> and we call him Uncle Fail. And, <laughs> and I found um, something that, oh, I think I turned it off, so here we go. Um, so if you look at the right, um, this is called Becky. And this is the Mattel version of a Barbie figure who used a wheelchair to get around. And what it said on the box, it said, Becky, friend of Barbie. And so I gave Becky to Haley. And what do you think she did after she took Becky out of the box? What's the first thing she did? <laughs> took her out of the chair. What did she do next? What do three-year-olds do with their dolls? I heard it take off their clothes. And then she put Becky back in the wheelchair. And so she said, Uncle Pat, will you play with me? Because I come from Wisconsin originally. I'm in Chicago land. Now I'm the only uncle who will play with the kids. The rest kind of sit around and drink beer in Wisconsin. So, she didn't have her average Barbie house, it was the Barbie dream house. And what did we discover about Becky in the dream house? Yes, you are totally correct, it wasn't accessible. So, Becky could not fit in the door of the dream house. And secondly, how many floors are in the dream house? This was Wisconsin, it was two. And so she had to become naked crying back in a wheelchair to get to the upper floors. And so what we did is we 
wrote a letter to Mattel at the time, and a few things were brought forward. So first of all, we shared about the inaccessibility of the house, and also the pink Corvette. At the time, remember those? Yeah, I see a lot of women saying I have one of those. Uh, and what we did is we wrote also is, this was even more compelling, couldn't she also be Barbie? Because think of all the different types of Barbies there are. Could Barbie potentially use a wheelchair? And so it was a very compelling thing. So we never heard back from Mattel, but at the time I was trying to teach Haley first person language, so people with disabilities. And by the way, everyone, she couldn't say the word disability. What came out and said, she said, people with possibilities. I said, wow, I like your word a lot better. You know what, you don't even need to learn the other word. And what has happened since? So this was Becky from the 90s, and here we are in 2020. You're all here, you made it. Um, beautiful thing. And what I discovered in the last few months, and maybe some of you who do toy stores have discovered this, we now have the Barbie Fashionistas. And guess what? Barbie is using a wheelchair, first of all. The second thing, check out the ramp for the dream house. <laughs> yes! You know what? They never answered us, but they listened. <laughs> And that is Haley today. That is in Laramie, Wyoming, where I'm heading after this conference. She's a second grade teacher in Laramie, is working with a school that was struggling, and now they're being noted for their fine quality education. Go, Haley! So I'm really happy about that, as you can see. I want to ask you, uh, how many people have children in the room? Please self-identify. Wow! <laughs> wow, I can tell you're at the right conference. So, what are some things that you dream for them in life? Let's do some shout outs. Happiness. Health. What I heard three things at once. Independence. Safety, confidence. Independence. Friendship. Two, at the same time, two at the same time. What else? Independence. Independence. Opportunities. Oh, I love these. You are my people. You know what, I like all these things around here, but you're the best part of this conference. And you know what? I want my children to be happy, and you said so much more. So one really important point is our conference thinks about awe, but not the rest of the world thinks that way. So I believe all parents want quality for their kids because Everything that you just shared is really portraying the quality of life. And that is so important, and every fantastic parent wants that for their kids. I am not the king of gloom and doom, but I'm going to share with you some statistics. Is that being achieved? Let's talk about this. So first of all, 45% of American students do not go to college, but 95% of American students with developmental disabilities do not go to college. In equity off the charts. The second one, of the two million American men and women that are incarcerated, 26% have disabilities. And you hear news stories about this. I always wonder, when I hear about the news stories, do law enforcement have the same understanding about things such as communication, social supports, things such as that, that a peak registrant would have. And I really appreciate people who reach out to their local law enforcement and build partnerships and make things happen. The next one, students who have mental support needs, 70% do not receive the care they need. And you see the implications of this in schools. Try to get in a school easily these days. So typically in most that I go into, there's a double lock system, and I have to surrender my ID. Um, they do background checks in a fair amount of places, and we see the ramifications. The 
next one is students with disabilities are suspended and expelled at a rate roughly twice that of their non-disabled peers. And of the over 2 million students with emotional or behavioral support needs, only 40% graduate from high school as compared to 81% overall graduation in the US. You know what I think about when I hear statistics like that? is we all believe in this audience that behavior is a form of communication. And if you figure out what somebody is communicating through their behavior, you're halfway to solving it. And I don't think that is always happening when I see statistics such as this. People with disabilities are three times more likely to live alone. The next one, over 75% of people with developmental disabilities are unemployed, and over 90% of people with autism are unemployed. And by the way, I'd like to say that's going down. It's going up. The next one, I come from the state of Illinois, Chicago land. We rank number 47 in the United States in terms of effective adult services for people with disabilities. Illinois, Arkansas, Texas, and Mississippi. Sorry if you're from some of those lands, but I'm self-confessing on this list too. Colleen Witt, who's from the Governor's Council on Disability in Minnesota, who usually fares pretty well, she says, Patrick, why do you stay in Illinois? And I say, Colleen, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> okay, here we go. And why do we have those horrible statistics? Because I want to get out of this. I believe we have the most landmark law in special education in 1975, where it's the first time people said all. Supports for all people. And that was at the time called Public Law 94 142. Everybody here knows about that. It's morphed into IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And it was a landmark law because we said all. However, there were some issues that are still living with us today that are holding us back. So first of all, the way people qualify for services is we have to identify deficits in order to get funding. How many people want their deficits showcased? I mean, me neither. I mean, I sometimes, you know, I have in my title with ADHD the word disorder. I'd much rather be the nutty professor than the disordered <laughs> professor. Um, also, too, the next one is, at the time, is well-meaning people thought the right thing to do was to put individuals disability, with disabilities together and in a smaller group and we go slower and it was very different than what everybody else was receiving. According to my statistics, has that worked? No. And then a huge other part of this is separate budgets for special education created two separate worlds of special education and general education. And the two did not cross easily. So there were separate buses. There were separate classrooms. There was a special wing in the school. And if you talk to a special educator who's taught you know, from the 70s on, they will tell you it wasn't always in the most desirable places in the school. So it could be in um, the boiler room area. Um, so it didn't have a lot of prestige at the time. And there were separate classrooms, tables, in the lunchroom, separate professional development. And you know what? In most places that I go to, there's still those separate budgets. And we don't look at education. We still look at general education and special education. And the two worlds do not always cross. That's why when a lot of people in here took your jobs, you inherited that special system. And it's one of the hardest eggs to crack ever. And we have so much research telling us there's something we should be doing different. Here's the good news, is every week I meet students, families, teachers, professionals, leaders, paraeducators who are going beyond this horrible reality 
transcending what is taking place and creating educational outcomes. I want everybody in this room to think about what you have done to make that happen. And I want you at some point today, you know, at a reception, do a toast to yourself. Celebrate your accomplishments and feel free to share them because you will not meet a better audience in the world than the people that are here right now to share something a little out of the box with. Am I right about that? Do you feel the love? Okay, yes, give yourself a hand. That, and that, just, that was so relevant. So my new book, what I'm doing is looking at practices that are still with us when we started the field of special education for all people that need to go and what we should be doing instead. Let's talk about that. So first of all, what needs to go? And we heard great testament from Alex Lee's team, who are all before me right now, is that one size fits all and everybody learns the same way does not work. And you gave such wonderful, true confessions about that. Melissa, thank you for that. You had me crying by the end. And wow. And so one of the things that I have done is written a couple of books. One is Pedro's Well. One is Just Give Him the Well. Wrote them with Paula Clute about how we embrace and support people's passions and interests. And you know what? That helps to make learning thrive, happen. It makes it exciting, engaging, fun, wonderful. And guess what? People go further if we embrace that. So that's a really great first point. And just think about some things. Uh, do you have a unique interest? So think about yourself. And actually, you know what, I'll pull the room. How many people have a unique interest? Raise your hand. OK, there's a bunch of them. How many people have skydived before and would love to do it again? OK. How many people have eaten a food that would make others cringe? Survivor was on last night, right? How many people like a sports team that is not near where you live? How many people try to watch all the Academy Award nominated movies? How many of you are successful with that? <laughs> How many people are up on all the current video games? Alex, is that you? I think you know a thing or two about them. Um, is not scared to sing? Oh, you just self-identified with that one. How many people have achieved something very difficult? I bet you there are so many people here. Um, how many people have had an embarrassing moment that would top all of them? <laughs> how many people do something extreme to work out? How many people is an, are experts on unique facts? Oh, cool, this is great. You know what? People look around and talk to these people at the reception. Um, how many people have traveled to a very exotic place? How many people have the best kids ever? Hands, if they're here, raise your hands. How many people have the best significant other ever? If they're here, raise your hand quickly. How many people have a passion for something not mentioned? I'm sure that's pretty much everyone. But you know what? These are the kinds of things that make life worth living, they make school worth going to, they make learning fun, exciting, engaging, and really amazing. So one of the things, I go into lots of schools and school systems, human service agencies, all over the place. People say, what's your specialty age? I say, womb to tomb. Because I work with people that they need to tell me that. And so the first thing I want to know is, I want to know what a person's passions or interests. There's going to be a collision sooner or later. There will be. OK. so. Uh, I want to know what a person's passions and interests because you know what? That helps me develop a relationship with kids. It helps me to be able to uh, support them in their learning. And it also actually reduces or prevents any needs for positive behavior supports if you can do that with a person. John Hattie, who's a big educational guru, he says that this is one of the most important things that people do with somebody else if you are in a teaching 
uh, situation with them. So very important. Um, best practices components. So here are my components for inclusion, attending the neighborhood school. If it's not a neighborhood school system like Chicago, Chicago doesn't always have that, but I want fam all families to have the same level of choice if there are things like magnet schools and charter schools. So the choice is for everyone. The next one, a general education homeroom. You are a member. No segregation, planning, solving problems, innovative diverse learning strategies. Everybody is equal with the realization that every team for a student revolves around the student and the next experts in their life are their family members. And I tell all educators, if you do a good job collaborating in wonderful times as well as tough times, is it will take you far in teaching someone. Also, doing away with learned helplessness. Learned helplessness to me is the worst disability of all because if somebody has an existing disability, it could double it. And you know what my best uh, recommendation for learned helplessness is? You're carrying it. So ever been in a meeting and you maybe as a family member say, well, he does that at home. Or somebody says, well, she does that at school. Seems sometimes that teams are on different pages of one another. Well, what I always do is I get permission from the student and their family to do some film clips if we're at odds about anything, so we can come together and do things about learned helplessness. And so it might be doing little film clips only for use with the educational team that um, maybe are filmed with an iPad, things such as that. The next one is seeing behavior as a form of communication, said that already, using the whole educational bag of tricks, providing access to after school clubs and activities. That is my uh, stepson Dan, it was a true game changer for him when a gaming club that he advocated for happened in the high school. My stepson had actually been in an alternative school for a number of years, and then we had to relook some at some things. Do you think that sat well with me when I inherited him as a parent? So uh, we relooked at some things and we got Dan back in his general school because actually there was a misdiagnosis with a medication that was contributing to behavior rather than supporting it. By the way, that happens frequently for people. And um, he actually advocated for the gaming club, became the president. Guess what's happening with Dan now? He uh, decided that he likes animals better than people, and he is like two quarters away from becoming a vet tech. So uh, this is so cool. Really excited about it. Thank you. And you're the people who get it. You know, and thank you for that. I knew my people. I couldn't be happier. The next one is being committed to making it work. So there's a saying from Henry Ford, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right either way, and that is what will happen. So your attitude, your belief, your conviction is everything. And I believe I'm with people who are like that. I've seen you in the halls today. <laughs> yes. OK. Uh, the next one is a single classroom may involve a lot of different labels and things such as that. Really, the best label to give someone is a person's name. However, I saw a cartoon, and it had an administrator type of a person, a, a wonderful administrator, that was um, at a desk, and there were a whole bunch of labels like this on the table that said, welcome to school, please take a label. And you think about that. However, what needs to go is the skill and drill in separate curriculum in a separate classroom. There is no research study ever been brought forward that shows this works. Thank you. And here's what we do instead. Universal design supports available to create access in all classrooms. And the three areas, it would be, first of all, how
how we represent curriculum. So right now I am using my voice. You are seeing slides. This will be posted uh, in the conference handouts. I never post them before you hear me because I won't surprise. <laughs> and so that's representation. Graphic organizers, study guides, apps that add voice, that highlight, that allow for dictation, all sorts of things. Um, engagement. So giving students voice and choice for how they do their work. Voice and choice. The research shows that students actually learn more, understand more, and assess better when they have voice and choice. Uh, allow individuals to demonstrate the learning in the best manner possible. So does a student like to write? Do they like to keyboard? Do they like to physically demonstrate something? Do they like to graphically demonstrate something? Uh, also students who need to talk out ideas. So I'm a big fan of turn and talks. It's uh, not a big commitment to bring them forward, but some kids need to talk out what educators are teaching them to be able to understand. So that's allowing access. And expression. Uh, everybody, how many people in here do well with traditional pencil, paper, and maybe uh, we would say tests that um, could also be electronic? Too? Don't be scared to raise your hand because I'm going to say, you know, these are the traditionalists. No, I'm not going to say that. Actually, for the people who wrote, raise their hand or rose their hand, uh, I am very envious of because it wasn't my best way of assessing. So what are options? Can we do a project, take an oral test, make a model? You give kids a uh, responsibility of making a film, they're off the hook. Our kids today are so multimedia and giving a demonstration portfolio. So those are what we would like to see in classrooms. And by the way, people make the wrong assumption that universal design is a special education endeavor. It is a general education endeavor that is designed for all students, and it helps us immensely in inclusion. Immensely. So also it's all about a support plan. So think about when you were a teenager, you know, what uh, things did you have that help make life work. But I want to ask you some questions about today. First of all, how many people this morning had coffee with caffeine in it? Please raise your hands. Wow! No wonder you've been doing so well. How many people will have or had something that's already that was different with caffeine in it? How many people raise their hands twice? How many people will be raising their hands twice? Yeah. So. Um, that's a support. The next one is how many people are wearing glasses we can see right now? By the way, we know who you are. <laughs> how many people are wearing steep grit glasses, maybe contacts, or you have the reading ones stashed in your pocket, like I do? How many people, uh, where you live, and this goes as well for uh, cities, it goes as well for uh, suburbs and rural communities, how many people, based on kind of that rush hour time, will take different routes to where you need to go to? And even in places that technically have one street, but there's an alley, you know? <laughs> so, um, but, and really what I'm talking about right now is these are all things you do for yourself that create a support plan. And I believe it's all about the support plan. But I also believe it's different for different people. And that's why we have the testament from our fine co-teachers from Melissa and Casey sharing that they had to rethink what they were doing. And Alex, thank you for educating them. Did you know we'd be educating so many adults? And give a big hand for Alex. And and I want to say something about Isabel. She's going to go beyond me, <laughs> for sure. I am totally positive. If not, she already is. I'm giving Isabel a hand, too. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. OK. So what we're trying to do is have a commitment to accessibility. 
And that's why we need every person at this conference to advocate for this in all aspects of life, in schools, in the community. How many of you have broken a bone before? Uh, what did you learn when you broke a bone? It hurts. What else? It's hard to do things, most of them. I broke uh, my left, uh, actually, it was the fifth metatarsal foot, uh, doing a kickboxing kick. Landed wrong, and it was really painful. So I was in Chicagoland, went to West Suburban Hospital. I was low priority, because he said I was sure you broke it, because everybody else next to me were gunshot wound victims. Ever seen Chicago Med? <laughs> and so, but here's what I learned when I broke my foot. I learned, first of all, how fast I do everything. The second thing, I learned how much I carry, and it became my time for backpacks. So I still have them in me, have them in a bunch of different sizes, because I could use my crutches and my backpack at the same time. By the way, Barb, Buswell is sitting right next to my backpack. The founder of Peak, would you give her a big, huge hand? Woo -hoo! Yes, absolutely. You, see, you know I go to seventh grade. Okay, so um, I was also um, very thankful at the time for some, we would say, environmental or architectural accessibility. I loved curb cuts because I was not graceful. I had crutches, I would trip, I would fall. Um, create more issues for myself, and that made things a little bit smoother. And you know what? I needed to learn all those lessons considering what I do now. It was really, really important. Oh, I just turned it off again. Do you think my people sometimes hit the wrong button? Would anybody who's never hit the wrong button please stand up? Okay. And then we have co-teaching. So um, what needs to go? General and special education being two worlds. So, uh, do you think this looks like Melissa and Casey? Not quite, okay. Uh, but uh, let's talk about it. You know what? The last couple of years there were five models, and now there are seven models of co-teaching. You want to hear the new one? So you can see them up there. But I love this new one. And this was created by Paula Kluth and Julie Cawson. It's the one teach, one make multi-sensory. So one person is in the lead, and the other creates a multi-sensory experience. So they could be acting something out. They could be doing a chant. They could be doing a song. They could be doing a poem. They could be doing sketch noting with notes and sketches. They're talking about the rainforest, and the other one is misting the classroom to create the rainforest 4D effect. OK? Uh, and that's a great model. Uh, one that I created, because there's so much research on student leadership, it's called Students as Co-Teachers. So students doing demonstration, a leadership role in a group, or teaching things to other students. And it supports all of the research. So we have all of the research to show that inclusive education works. And here's my belief about co-teaching is, you know what, it is not new. The, a long time ago it was brought forward, but here's what happened. People said, well, go to a workshop, uh, and then what happened is school people were assigned. So there were, you know, you two do it, you two do it, you two do it, and people were kind of thrown in alliance down, and there wasn't a lot of training, and there wasn't coaching when we initially started out. And that was very different. And I'm going to say something really powerful in my entire time, which involves decades in the field. It's been the number one game changer for inclusive education. However, I tread lightly with that because I believe you have to have the right support system. And I also believe when you're promoting co-teaching, all means all with that as well. So we have to consider everyone. So those are some highlights with co-teaching, but you heard a wonderful testament of how it can work. By the way, it's the closest relationship two adults can have in a school, because why are we in schools in the first place? It is to teach, and if you put two people together to do that, you want it to be better.
than if one person had done it alone. That is really the goal. How do we make it work for everyone? It also has some interesting practices. So if you think about it, we have arranged multiple marriages with co-teaching because most specialists co-teach with, sometimes it's one person, but a lot of times it's more than one person. There's more general educators than special educators in the school. And then we have something called forced divorces. It's everything we don't want to promote in a relationship. But I see it actually doing wonders. So actually, one district that I'm working with right now, they contacted me before the school year, and they said, our theme this year is diversity and making learning work for everyone. We want you on every institute day. And we want you to do a session for everyone. And we want co-teaching. We want a variety of other practices. Co-teaching is not the only practice. It's one thing we do in a lot of different things to make inclusive education work. But it's been a big game changer. And what they also have me doing with different teams that are doing a variety of different inclusive practices, I am coaching them. So it's kind of my dream. It's a school district that's kind of nearby. And I go in there, and I'm part of every professional development major day for the whole school system. And I'm also part of making practices come alive. Because sometimes I've been in groups before. I said, you know what? That was a really nice group. I really like them. And I said, I wonder how they're going to use the information. So I'm thinking about, is it going to really happen? in the school district. So there's another school district that I've been coaching for three years training and coaching. And this year, one of the lead administrators and assistant superintendent who is in charge of data for the school district, she said, Patrick, the students' scores are all going up. And I believe it's what is happening through your teaching of inclusive practices and in coaching. So how many people in here don't want their school district to get better? You know, so if you are a leader of a school district, if you are working as a teacher, if you are working as a paraprofessional, related service professionals, this is really important stuff. These are big game changers. Uh, there's so many benefits and here's one of them that I think is very um, compelling. It's a model that's called complementary teaching. So it's one person in a lead, and the other is paraphrasing, saying something in a different way, extending ideas. You want to hear the research about this? Is it is engaging for kids, and they get more of those moments. Oh, I get that now and it contributes positively to learning, understanding, and also positive student assessment. There have been researchers that have spent thousands of hours now in co-taught classrooms that are finding out some pretty amazing things. Uh, also, how we view and characterize people with dignity and respect is really important, and what needs to go is we need to stop out all that outdated language and characterization. Uh, this morning I got to do a podcast. I see, uh, I think Tina and uh, Patty are there. Uh, they're wonderful people. And they were very compelled by this particular poem from Meyer Shevin, which depicts two different ways of looking at something. So here's what I want to do. I want to read the statements and have you repeat them. With the we statements, I'm going to use my typical voice. With the they statements, I'm going to use a scary voice. And I ask you to always also try to replicate my voice. <laughs> we like things. We like things. They fixate on objects. <laughs> we try to make friends. We try to make friends. They display poor peer socialization. <laughs> we stand up for ourselves. They are non-compliant. <laughs> we have hobbies. They self-stim. <laughs> we 
choose our friends wisely. They display poor, pure socialization. We persevere. They perseverate. We love people. They have dependencies on people. We go for a walk. They run away. We insist. They tantrum. We change our minds. They are disoriented and have short attention spans. We have talents. They have splinter skills. We are human. And they are. So Meyer Shevin created this amazing poem. I thought it was so compelling. I asked him if I could use it in my first book, From Disability to Possibility. And he said yes, very graciously. We lost him several years ago, unfortunately. An amazing man. He was a big part of TASH conferences. And some of the words that are phrases, social justice, uh, human rights are part of TASH. Uh, he just embodies all of these types of things, too, as well. This is my most fun conference, by the way. I have so much fun here. I love it. I mean, karaoke? Yes. OK, so um, what this really illustrates, though, is the language that we use is really important. It is really powerful. By the way, there's another perspective, and it's called the disability studies perspective, where individuals take back their labels and it, they will put the label before the person. And here's my belief about the perspectives. I want us to use an informed perspective. And there's some great rationales for both. But what I don't want to hear is an entirely uninformed perspective, where we're using language haphazardly, and that it's not respectful, it's not representing dignity. The kind of horrible stuff you hear on the playground. You idiot, you moron. You know, when those used to be actual classifications for people with disabilities in the 1950s, how horrible that they are derogatory language on our playground now. Um, what needs to go is inclusion for some students. Really, we need to, inclusion is for all, and having a transformational process for systems change. Actually, this is going to be my afternoon session, is we're going to talk about transformational leadership. And it was originally kind of for administrators, but we decided to make it for all at the conference. Here are some things that I recommend if you're looking for ways to go in terms of bringing inclusion forward. If you're at kind of a stumbling block in the path, you're, you're wondering how to make it into a stepping stone. So first of all, a leadership retreat. So people understand the practices. I would say leaders greatly influence the practices in a school district. By the way, there are several school districts where I have gotten to a very inclusive place that the leadership changed and they went backward in time. It's one of the things that breaks my heart the most in the world. And maybe some of you have experienced that. The next one is book studies. Paul Cluse, you're going to love this kid. Um, Marissa Pan Shevin, um, Widening the Circle, From Disability to Possibility, that I wrote. They are all great books for book studies. And to have them at a district level, so think about a district team. Could we have parents represented, leaders, teachers, and could we have other services represented? How about some kids on the district level committee? And what we would have is some representatives from each school in the district that would bring it back to a building level with a building level team talking about how we facilitate change, how we 
I've learned, book studies are great, professional development, things such as that. And I really respectfully uh, think Melissa and Casey's idea was outstanding, is giving people some time to think about and how they're going to orchestrate moving forward as well. I'm visiting other district schools and classrooms, staff and parent learning. I'm looking at all of the best practices that we talk about for school systems, I believe should be also brought forward to families. A model demonstration, and how do we bring that forward? Thinking big, but taking steps one at a time, because if we do it in a thoughtful manner that uses research and best practice, we can go far. And sharing the model demonstration of what is taking place at district and building levels, and expanding it it, with further creation of teams. So you keep building on that. To create inclusion is for all people. So that's a really important thing. I'm going to talk more about the dynamics with this in the session. Uh, remember the TV show Cheers? A place you could go where everybody knows your name. It seems like our world is kind of a busy, uh, complicated place. Just look at the news or social media these days. But I believe an inclusive life in schools leads to an inclusive life in the community because you build relationships in the school, in your neighborhood, with people in the community, and I think that expands like ripples. I think ripples are a really great way to look at that. And for people who feel they have not achieved that, I don't want anybody to feel bad in our audience because there's a very, very important statement. It's never too early, it's never too late. And don't give up hope, don't give up trying. Uh, there's a saying, the student you think you can do the least with will do the most to make you proud. And this one's from Paula Kluth, who I've written several books with. Don't quit five minutes before the miracle happens. <laughs> so we want to lead into an inclusive life in the community. And an example of an inclusive life is Justin Hanha. He illustrated the cover of Just Given the Whale and all the illustrations in Pedro's Whale. Uh, this is a conference. You would like this conference. Uh, this is in New Jersey, and it's in Montclair, New Jersey, at Montclair State University, and it's called the Citizens for Inclusive Communities Conference. I got to do a keynote with Justin, who did my book illustrations, Paul and my book illustrations, and he did really well. And he is a talented drafts fan. He likes filmography types of things. He is so good. He um, also works part-time while going to school at a bakery and does design and things like that. And he also happens to have autism as an attribute. The reason I say disability is an attribute because there's so many things that make every person who they are. And the disability shouldn't be all-encompassing. <coughs> people are people. And the other people that were here, um, Justin's brother Julian and Kate, um, his transition teacher at the time, who I worked with in, with in Wisconsin. And Justin has an inclusive life. His parents moved to three different states during the time that he was being educated, that's a hard knock life for a family. But he graduated and he is, has been working on further studies and he has quite the portfolio and he's doing freelance work and design in a bakery. There's a waiting list for his cakes um, in a bakery in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one because I wanna share with you why I believe we should be doing this. First of all, is when people ask me what is the most important profession, I don't say what most people say. Most people say doctor, okay? I believe doctors are very, very important. They are the reason some of us are here today. Some people say lawyer. I think lawyers are extremely important for a different reason. But you know what? My answer is teacher. Because first of all, who taught 
all of the doctors and lawyers. <laughs> Teachers who have a license or um, we would say a certification. But let's look at it further. Is who is the first teacher for a kid? Their parents. Who is the ongoing teacher for their kid when a licensed teacher doesn't have the kid anymore? Who has the son and daughter the other 18 hours of the day? And you know what? When people share who inspired them most in their life, it is parents and it is teachers that we learn something really significant in school from. And I want everybody to walk out of here today and be that person for others. If it's your kids, if it's your students, if it is for whatever you do that advances the status of diversity, I think it's all important. And then for no better reason, we will all have a disability someday if we're lucky to get it. It's called old age. We might not be able to do all the things we take for granted right now, but it's an honor to get it. And guess what? Guess who will be supporting us in our old age? Our kids, our students. So I want everybody to walk out of here with my job description. I think every great teacher hands out life chances for kids. Isn't that what a great education should do for someone? Whether it's within your family, whether it's within a school, whether it's within the community. So what I say is hand out great life chances to your kids and in turn they'll do the same for us. It has been such a major honor to be back and I want you to just do good things for kids. Thank you for having me, everyone. You're fantastic. Give you a hand too. Thank you so much. And the good thing is, my people end on time. Are the micros somebody else? Oh, yes, Norman and I are going to talk. Oh, okay, I get to do this now. So, um, this is a very, very important thing. So, uh, first of all, is this is super, super important what brings us here today is the whole PEAK organization. By the way, this organization started in 1986. And guess what, everybody who started it were parents. It's Barb and parents that made this national organization come to life. And also, um, PEAK is entirely nonprofit. And the really big purpose of PEAK is to serve family and youth well. And I think Pete does an amazing, wonderful job of doing that. And also, it is not just Denver. It is the entire state of Colorado. And there is also huge national impact. As I said before, this is one of my favorite conferences ever. I love coming here. And if you look at who Pete works with, it is youth, it is families. It is, we go beyond the families, to grandparents. Um, we work with adults, and we also work with teachers, schools, all the constituents, and leaders. And what we want you to do is in your bag, and thank you, Norm, for this, because I, I have stuff all over the place in this room. There is a clear packet, which is a donation um, type of envelope, and I just want to make a big plea to everyone is to really support PEAK through your do donations. Make it one of your causes. By the way, I myself donate to PEAK because I am such a believer in this. And we will take credit cards, checks, uh, cash, uh, things such as that. And we really appreciate uh, your help and support. It's why this organization stays alive. Nonprofit agencies aren't making this come by magic, is we make it happen. So I want to thank everyone for this. I'm going to give the mic over for, to Norm for just a second, who is uh, ahead of the board. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Denver and the conference. I'd like you first to give a hand round of applause to Patrick for his very stimulating presentation.